Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Ray Minya. And I'm Bo Leung. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Chief Secretary admits she's not optimistic about getting political reform passed by pan-democrats. Protesters make last-ditch attempt to get chief executive's attention ahead of policy address. And French police hunting for accomplice after two hostage situations end in bloodshed. Chief Secretary Carrie Lam has admitted she's not confident the government's political reform package will be passed by lawmakers due to a veto by the pan-democrats. At the same time, the constitutional affairs chief has warned that a by-election triggered by Democrat lawmaker Abbott Ho's resignation might cost $200 million. Round two of the government's constitutional reform consultation got underway on Wednesday. But so far, it seems to have done little to solve Hong Kong's political impasse. 23 pan-democratic lawmakers are standing firm on their threat to veto the exercise, unless Beijing scraps a strict framework on the 2017 chief executive race. Even the government's point woman on political reform admitted things are not looking good. Chief Secretary Carrie Lam told radio listeners this morning that she has zero confidence that the final election blueprint will be approved by two-thirds of lawmakers later this year. The pro-Beijing camp holds 42 seats in the chamber, while President Zhang Yuxing can resign to vote as well. But that still falls short by four votes, meaning some pan-democrats must U-turn for the reform package to pass. Lam says she will try to lobby the pan-democrats in private and persuade them to change their minds. The government argues that while the electoral model isn't perfect, achieving one man, one vote is still a big step forward and gradual improvements can be made in the future. But Lam admitted it's not logical to talk about the distant future. She also said it's impossible to coerce Beijing into making concessions. That includes the proposed resignation of Democratic Party lawmaker Albert Ho, which would trigger a by-election he claims would act as a referendum. Ho's announcement yesterday of his plan puzzled pan-democrats and was labelled as pointless by others. Constitutional Affairs Chief Raymond Tan warned today that if Ho goes ahead with his plans, the subsequent by-election may cost taxpayers as much as $200 million. A similar exercise in 2010 by five pan-democratic lawmakers cost $120 million, drawing criticism from the public. The political reform debate got heated on the radio show this morning. Pro-Beijing unionist Wong Kwok Heng slammed Frederick Fung and his democratic allies for boycotting the second consultation, saying it's irresponsible to ignore public opinion. Feng accused Wong of bowing to Beijing's pressure and supporting anything the government puts on the table. An object was thrown at Chief Executive Leng Chengying today, but it didn't hit him. The incident happened at around 3 o'clock this afternoon as he attended an award ceremony at Sha Tin Racecourse. A man in the crowd suddenly flung something, possibly an egg, at the Chief Executive. But it was deflected by a security officer who was walking alongside Leng. The thrower was then taken away from the scene by security guards and has been handed over to the police. Protesters took to the streets today in a last-ditch attempt to highlight causes they want addressing in Chief Executive Leung Chen Ying's policy address on Wednesday. This year, it seems the lack of affordable housing is once again the main problem. And Jiang reports. Chief Executive Leung Chen Ying probably finished writing his policy address days ago, but some Hong Kongers were out on the streets today, reminding him of certain issues he may have missed out. More than 10 members of the Labour Party, led by lawmakers Li Chuk Yan, Sid Ho and Fernando Cheng, chanted slogans and marched from central government offices to Leung's office at around noon. They were demanding better housing policies and hoping Leung will be able to squeeze something into Wednesday's address about resuming rent control. They wrote their demands, which also included a request for the government to build no less than 30,000 public housing flats a year on a long yellow banner. Meanwhile, members of the Alliance for Defending the Grassroots Housing Rights were also issuing demands about housing outside CGO. They complained that housing policies are too focused on the home ownership scheme 
which they say forces young people to buy homes and should instead concentrate on public housing. They also complained about subsidized housing prices, saying they're too tied to the market, which makes it difficult for young people to buy homes. The protesters also called for the income limit for public housing tenants to be raised so more people qualify for it. Anne Chang, ATV News. Fresh chickens will return to local wet markets tomorrow after sales were suspended for nearly two weeks. Around 3,200 chickens from eight local farms will be taken to the temporary quarantine station in Ta Kuling overnight. Distribution will be carried out at the site, something that was initially forbidden until the government struck a deal with local villagers yesterday. But mainland imports will remain suspended until the 21st of this month after a batch tested positive for H7 bird flu. Two people were injured in a car accident in Aberdeen early this morning. Police are looking into the cause of the accident and suspect the car had been modified. Rachel Leung reports. The accident happened at around midnight when the car was traveling along Aberdeen Prior Road and the driver suddenly lost control. The vehicle crashed into the curb then smashed against some railings. The force of the impact was so great that the roof of the car was sliced off. The steering wheel and parts of the engine were scattered across the road. Around 20 meters of metal railing were destroyed by the vehicle. The 24-year-old driver and a passenger were trapped inside after the accident. They had to be rescued by firefighters. They suffered serious injuries and were sent to Queen Mary Hospital. The police have been investigating the cause of the crash. The driver's injuries prevented him from taking a breathalyzer test at the scene of the crash. Rachel Lang, ATV News. ATV's executive director Ip Kapo is still unable to give a timeline for when staff will get last month's salaries. Labor chief Matthew Jung said his department is weighing up whether to prosecute the company and has staff lined up ready to be witnesses. And Jung reports. After being delayed for over a month and a half, ATV staff finally received their November wages earlier this week, but they still have no idea when they will get their December salaries. Company director Ip Kapo admitted today that he still can't give them a timetable, but he hopes it's soon. Regarding the unpaid licensing fee owed to the communications authority, Ip said he is trying to work out some sort of deal to pay in installments. Meanwhile, Labor and Welfare Secretary Matthew Cheung says inspectors from his department have interviewed ATV staff, and some of them say they are willing to be witnesses if the company is prosecuted. Uh, once uh, we've, we got clear advice from the, direct, from, from, from the Department of Justice um, that there is a case for prosecution, we will certainly act accordingly. Cheung added that the process wouldn't take long, but it's a question of whether they have sufficient evidence for prosecution. Anne Chang, ATV News. French police are hunting the girlfriend of a gunman who held up a supermarket in Paris and died when police stormed the building. At the same time, two men blamed for the attack on a magazine in the French capital on Wednesday were killed in a hail of police bullets after opening fire on officers. Joss Wool reports. Two brothers wanted for a bloody attack on the officers of French magazine Charlie Hebdo were killed when police stormed their hideout. The men had holed themselves up in a print shop in the small French town of the Martin en Gaulle, 35 kilometers northeast of Paris. Gunshots were heard. Then there was silence. Officials said the brothers, Sherif and Said Kowachi, emerged from the building and opened fire on police before they were killed. Yesterday they were pursued in a high-speed car chase before they took refuge in the building. They grabbed a hostage who was said to be safe. At the same time, police were dealing with a second siege at a Jewish supermarket in eastern Paris. Armed officers stormed the shop where several hostages had been taken by an armed man who threatened to kill them if police stormed the building where the two brothers were hiding. Some of the hostages managed to flee from the premises, but four were killed and several wounded in the police operation. The gunman Amdi Koulibaly died during the siege. Police are hunting for his girlfriend and suspected accomplice Hayat Boumadin. She was said to be with him when he shot a policewoman earlier this week. 
Police say the Kuwachi brothers and Kulibali had an arsenal of weapons, including an M82 rocket launcher, smoke grenades and two machine guns. President François Hollande described the event as a tragedy for the nation. In a televised address, he thanked the police for their bravery and efficiency, but insisted France still faces threats. U.S. President Barack Obama said he hoped the immediate threats were resolved and pledged U.S. support to France. In the streets of Paris, the world seen once again what terrorists stand for. They have nothing to offer but hatred and human suffering. And we stand for freedom and hope and the dignity of all human beings. And that's what the city of Paris represents to the world. But French Prime Minister Manuel Valls admitted that there had been a clear failing in French intelligence. Yesterday, a Syrian official quoted Valls as saying in 2013 that he could not prevent jihadists from going to Syria to fight in the Western-backed war to overthrow the government. Damascus said the Paris attack was an example of what happens when those fighters return home. Joyce Wu, ATV News. A huge car pileup in the U.S. has left dozens injured and one dead. But first in our international roundup, the tail portion of the doomed Air Asia passenger plane that crashed two weeks ago has been recovered. Investigators searching for the black boxes from the crashed Air Asia plane lifted the tail portion out of the Java Sea today, two weeks after it went down with 162 people on board. It was hoisted from a depth of about 30 meters using a crane. It was not immediately clear if the cockpit voice and flight data recorders were still inside the tail or fell out when the Airbus A320 crashed into the sea. Their recovery is crucial to finding out what happened. A Canadian truck driver died in a 123-vehicle pileup in the U.S. state of Michigan as cold weather continues to sweep across the U.S. Dozens were taken to hospital following the accident on the Kalamuzu County Interstate, which involved several trucks carrying fireworks and acid colliding and bursting into flames. Investigators say all the hazardous materials from the crash have burned off. Joyce Wu, ATV News.